I'm going to talk about the frontal and the sphenoid sinuses, and I really want you to have a functional understanding of the surgical anatomy so that it makes your dissection more appropriate. You need to know what's important and what's not, and you, they're basic relationships that you really need to recognize in order to achieve a complete dissection. And I want you to develop a framework in which to operate, which we're going to talk about in these lectures, and then we're going to demonstrate, and then you're going to do it this morning as well. And I think the easiest way of doing it is to try and simplify the paranasal sinuses. And I love this concept of a box. And I want you to think towards the final cavity that you want to achieve. I don't get bogged down in my crochet. I think that there's a lot of reasons why sinonasal anatomy is so challenging. And Brent started showing you the differences in the pneumatization within the ethmoid. But I think the biggest problem is we actually make it hard for ourselves. We make it hard by labeling so many different things. And I think at the end of the day, we've got to concentrate on what we want left over. And if we think about what we want left over, we've got to just know what can be damaged in removing what we want left over and ensuring that that's preserved and everything else is removed. And at the end of the day, we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. We tend to get lost in minutiae. Our anatomical textbooks really don't delineate what's relevant, and everything's presented in a 2D form, and we actually encounter it in, in the real world in 3D, and sometimes you really can't see the forest for the extensive trees. We're forced to learn 3D relationships, and there's tremendous variation in the sinuses, which makes it difficult. It might be due to prior surgery, it might be due to the disease altering it, and there's also significant variability in availability of instrumentation at different instrumentation, which makes things difficult, and that's particularly so for the frontal sinus. I love this. I, I came up with this about a year or two ago, and it's, I call it my Shakespearean guide to the sinuses. Because the maxillary sinus, to me, is a midsummer night's dream. I agree with Brent. I think it's a difficult sinus to do really well. But once you've done the maxillary sinus really well, it provides you with the most um, uh, a basic landmark and the most repeatable landmark to find your way through to the sphenoid. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about in a second. The ethmoid is as you like it. The ethmoid is awesome. It's a very forgiving sinus. And as long as you know where the skull base is, you know where the anterior ethmoid artery is, you know where the lamina preparation is, and you know where your middle and superior turbinates are, everything in the middle can be taken out. So I say the ethmoid is as you like it. The sphenoid I think it was Brent who said yesterday, so much ado about nothing. Okay, because the sphenoid is one of those sinuses where, God, don't enter the sphenoid. The truth of the matter is that what we're doing for inflammatory disease in the sphenoid is really not dangerous, and I'm going to show you why. It's really, really not. It's something that I do on every single face that I do. I, I was telling them this morning that I'm not I'm not an intelligent man. I can only know three operations. So I need to do a mini face for OMU, a complete face, or an extended face, which is Lothrop and medial maxillectomies. So it's not it's that way I, I can actually learn three operations. Finally, the frontal, and the frontal, I think, is the taming of the shrew, and the frontal has got its unique challenges because we're using angled telescopes, because we're using angled instrumentation, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. So let's just go to the sphenoid sinus quickly. The sphenoid sinus basically typically see it post pubically, and there's varying pneumatization of the sphenoid. The most common is this um, uh, uh, configuration here, the cellar configuration, where the whole new sphenoid is pneumatized, and you see the entire... Um, cellar, you see the, the clavus in the, the, the sphenoid when you open it up. And that's the best for us when we're talking about anterior skull base surgery because our approach is so easy. When you get a conchal um, a configuration where there's very little pneumatization, that makes it much more challenging. In terms of the sphenoid sinus, there's a couple of structures that you need to identify on your coronal scan. There's the vidian nerve, which you know contains the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. And I call it vidian is midian because it's always medial. It's, it's at the junction of the floor of the sphenoid and the medial pterygoid plate. And it's a very, very consistent landmark. And I love the vidian nerve because it takes me straight to the carotid. So if I'm trying to access the carotid, I go to the vidian nerve and I just follow the vidian nerve and it'll take me to the carotid canal. Just a lateral and superior to, to that is V2. And V2 is not a nerve that we really want to encounter. V2 we see when we're doing pterygopalatine surgery, but we really want to avoid V2. And sometimes you don't get the pneumatization of the pterygoid root like that, and it's well encased in bone. 
And the other important things are obviously the cavernous sinus with the carotid artery, the optic nerve. That's the anterior clinoid process. And when the anterior clinoid process is pneumatized, we have a, 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 a typical exposure of the optic nerve. We have a very deep primary opticocarotid um, recess. And that can lead to problems in the sphenoid if you don't identify it. So just having a look at the view we see ultimately, there's the optic nerve, there's that primary OCR, there's your carotid, there's the clival recess, here's the intestinal septum which is taken down, and there's the planum sphenodali, which is the roof. And that is the lowest part of the skull base, is the planum sphenodali, and it's hard bone. So I like to always get into the sphenoid low, find my planum sphenodali, and then I'm feeling a whole lot better about coming forward and removing all those ethmoid lamellae. Because suddenly if you get a step down as you're coming forward, you know there's a cell above it. So it's just easy. Puncture through it and take the cell away. You know that the planum sphenodali is always going to be the lowest area of your skull base. And it's hard bone, so it's a good, um, consistent landmark to find. So let's just take a step back and look at the basic framework. And I really thank Todd Kingdom and Richard Orlandi who, who did a lot of the work in terms of these diagrams, the, these block diagrams, and these slides are borrowed from them. So here we have, I want you to think of the surgical box as having a medial, a lateral, a superior, and a posterior wall. So we've got the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate, and as Brain pointed out, it's really in the same sagittal plane, the superior and the middle turbinate, and it's really important that you understand that concept. The superior and the middle turbinate lie just there on the coronal CT scan. Obviously, the medial boundary is the orbital wall or the lamina papyracea, which is variable as well. Superiorly, you've got the skull base, and posteriorly, you've got the anterior face of the sphenoid sinus. And that's our sphenoid box. Now, we have, uh, uh, Brent's already gone through the ethmoid cavity, so why am I going this, doing this again? And the answer is because it's really important in finding the sphenoid sinus. And Brent was itching to go onto the sphenoid sinus because it's such an integral part of your ethmoid dissection. So the first thing, and why I call them axillary sinus and midsummer night's dream, is because once you've got the roof of the maxillary sinus, that is the floor of the orbit, it is always, always in line with your sphenoid ostium. So you can proceed very, very safely through your entire ethmoid cavity posteriorly as long as you're staying below the height of the orbit. And this is particularly important when you've got bad disease in the sinuses where you can't really differentiate. If you've got a chondrosarcoma or something, you really can't see the skull base. And so you can track straight back at the height of the orbit, not going above it, into your sphenoid, find your plane of sphenoidali, you've got your height, and you can come back really safely. And we're going to show you how we do that in the laboratory today. So the key anatomical relationship that you need to understand is that the sphenoid ostium is consistently at the level of the roof of the maxillary sinus or the floor of the orbit. And you can bet, you can take that to the bank, it really, really is. Um, a, a, a key landmark. You're never going to injure the skull base if you stay below it. Never, ever. We've published on it. We've done extensive cadaveric study. You're never going to injure it. And the other important thing, and if these are the only two things you learned from me about the sphenoid, then it's been worthwhile. The second thing is the sphenoid ostium is always medial to the middle and the superior turbinate. And it's obvious because the turbinates are actually part of the ethmoid bone. So if you look at a disarticulated skull, there's the sphenoid, the ethmoid plugs in. So the turbinates are always coming in from lateral. The sphenoid ostium is always going to be medial to the middle and superior turbinate. I'm not going to go through this because Brent's done a good job already. But I want to just go over this again. You open the maxillary sinus. Once the maxillary sinus is open, I like to open it up right so that I can identify the orbital floor. Because once I've got that orbital floor, it's always going to be in the view of my scope. And I'm going to follow it straight back because that's going to show me the level of the sphenoid ostium and give me a very, very safe working distance going through the ethmoid. So orbital floor. And as soon as we've got the orbital floor, then we can take off the bulla. We've got the medial orbital wall. Now we've got our lateral boundary. So that's easy. Once we've got our lateral boundary, we know we can stay behind, below this level here. We can travel back and we can dissect everything along the middle turbinate and take out the basal lamella and take out the basal lamella and progress until we see the superior turbinate. Here's the middle turbinate, there's the superior turbinate. 
And we know the sphenoid ostium is going to be at the height of the orbital floor, medial to the sphenoid, to the superior turbinate. So even if you can't see it, you can roger through there safely at that height. You're never going to run into trouble unless you've got a completely um, uh, 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 a plastic sphenoid, and then you're going to have great difficulty pushing your, your freers or your curette through solid bone. But otherwise, you're always going to go into a cavity. And I'll use this particular case because here's an anode cell. There's the optic nerve up there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the anode cell. But your sphenoid is actually below here. Your sphenoid ostium is not there. And I've had so many patients refer to me who've had supposedly good sphenoid sinus surgery. And you see this beautiful anode cell. No one's been anywhere near the sphenoid. And the surgeon commonly mistakes that. And we were on a course with probably one of the world's most famous endoscopic sinus surgeons. And he said, you can see it's the sphenoid because it's pyramidal shaped. And we've got the skull base and there's the optic nerve. And everyone was a bit dubious. He said, well, I'll prove it to you. And he pushed the freers through the sphenoid ostium, and he wasn't in the sphenoid. And this is honestly one of the world's best. So I think it's really, really important that you remember that relationship of the superior turbinate and the height of the orbit. So there's the middle turbinate. There's the superior turbinate. And then we can safely go backwards towards the sphenoid ostium. This is the middle turbinate, which has been slightly medialized just to show the relationship. But as Brent said, they're in the exact same sagittal plane. The superior terminate attaches to the face of the sphenoid. So once you get to that plane there, you can cut back with a straight through cutting forcep. You're always going to identify the sphenoid ostium. Very, very safe way of accessing the sphenoid ostium. So we know the sphenoid ostium is there because of the heart of the orbit, because of the superior turbinate. We know the sphenoid cavity sits just there. We've got our posterior wall of our box, and we can go straight through. We go straight through into the sphenoid, and then we can bite laterally. We've got our medial orbital wall already defined, so we know how far laterally we can go. We can go superiorly. When you've got an anode cell, you've got to take a straight through cutting and bite that down, and now you've got a wide open box. And then you can see your planum sphenodali, your posterior skull base, and then you can start coming forward and clear the rest of the ethmoid air cells. So your final endoscopic view is going to be something like that, where you're just looking straight down the lamina. The, the maxillary sinus is almost going into the sphenoid here. There's the ethmoid cavity. Wide open, one wide open cavity. There are a couple of things that warrant acknowledgement in the sphenoid sinus. One is anode cells, and it's something you really got to identify on your preoperative CD scan. And the anode cell is simply a posterior ethmoid air cell, which is pneumatized, either lateral, superior, but it goes around the sphenoid above. And the problem with the anode cell is that it typically pneumatizes around the optic nerve and causes dehiscence of the optic nerve. And so if you don't recognize you're in an anode cell, you might think you're still in the posterior ethmoid. I can roger through because the sphenoid's behind it. Common misconception and with the old lynch howarth procedures that we used to do in the 70s and 80s, that was the commonest um, problem with people going into the skull base because you used to go through the posterior ethmoid and you knew the sphenoid was behind the ethmoid. It had to be. So you go straight through there and you enter the cranial cavity. And if you understand that there's an anode cell present, you're never going to do that. The other thing is obviously optic nerve injury. The other two important things is, is um, identifying the, with the anode cell on your coronal CT scan. And I'll give you a very easy way to do it. If you look at the coronal scan through the sphenoid and there's a horizontal bar, there's an anode cell. There may be multiple vertical bars. Those are intersinuscepta. The minute you've got a horizontal bar like that, it's an anode cell. How do you know you're not in the ethmoid that you're in the sphenoid? Look at the septum. If the septum goes all the way up to the skull base, you're still in the posterior ethmoid. If the septum doesn't go up to the skull base, you've you got the sphenoid above you. Very, very simple on a coronal CT scan. Always identify the anode cell and you'll stay out of trouble because of its relationship to the optic nerve and the internal carotid artery. And the biggest problem is if there's a dehiscence, obviously. The important thing is that with 99% of our case, unless you're going to skull base surgery, you just working on the anterior wall of the sphenoid. And as Brent pointed out yesterday, you're far away from the posterior wall where the optic nerve and the carotid are. So it's not a major problem. The other thing that I hear all the time, and I heard it yesterday as well, is be very wary of this intersinus septum, which has lateralized and attaches over the carotid artery. Because there were many, many case reports where, pay, where people had 
carotid artery injuries because of fracturing that intersinoseptum. Um, I think that is actually much, much less common now because we got through cutting instruments. When we were using grasping instruments and grabbing onto that intersinoseptum and fracturing it off, high risk of injuring the carotid artery. Nowadays, we tend to use through cutting instruments, take it right down, the risk is really, really small, but I still think it's something that should be noted on the preoperative CT scan. So let's talk a bit about the frontal sinus. I'm bang on time. Frontal sinus, we really, really need to differentiate our philosophy for frontal sinus surgery depending on the pathology that's there. We need to decide, are we doing it for inflammatory disease? Is this an operation we're doing for application of topical therapies? Is there a soft tissue neoplasm that we want to get to the base of? Um, or is this just fibrosseous disease that we want to just create ventilation uh, lateral to it? So we need to know exactly what we're doing. Anesthesia for me for the frontal is really important. I'm not going to go through anesthetic technique. I thought that Jamie did a great job of that yesterday. And the only important thing that I'm going to say about anesthe anesthesia when you do the frontal sinus is I have never, ever understood why people spend so much time decongesting the sphenoidal recess, decongesting the middle turbinate, when we know that the taming of the shrew is the frontal sinus. Nobody decongests the frontal sinus. Sinus. And Dombia Sethi from Singapore said to me, the best way of doing it is before you do anything in the ethmoid. And I can tell you it's revolutionized the way that I do frontal sinus surgery now. When I have, uh, am doing a face, I'll do my unsynectomy, I'll do my middle meatal antrostomy. The very next thing I do, long before I touch the bulla ethmoidalis, is I take a neurosurgical cotinoid and I insert it. There's the bulla intact. I insert it on the bulla and then just push it up the bulla. You can't go anywhere else. Even if there's a suprabulla recess, you'll ultimately come into the frontal sinus because the bulla is the posterior boundary of the frontal recess. So you put it into the frontal recess, push it up into the frontal, and then I'll take the string and I'll pull it over and use a little uh, clip and clip it to the drape. It's out my way. I don't see it again. I do my ethmoid. And by the time I finish my ethmoid, I take it out and I go, my God, I actually shouldn't be operating on this frontal. It's so wide open once you decongested it. And as I said, there were two things I wanted you to learn from me about the sphenoid. That's probably the one thing that I want you to learn from me about the frontal. It will change the way that you do frontal sinus surgery. The second is in instrumentation. The anatomy we're going to go through. So the frontal sinus is the last sinus to pneumatize. There's a very high degree of variability, and you need to assess it well on your preoperative CT scan. You need to ensure that there's not an aplasia of the frontal that you're trying to find. Um, it has an anterior and posterior table, and the skull base... The, the skull base posteriorly is really the anterior projection of, of the... I mean, the posterior uh, aspect is the anterior projection of um, the skull base. The frontal, the frontal sinus is drained inferiorly through the frontal recess into the ethmoid infundibulum. And just think of it as... Whoop, sorry. As the most anterior and superior aspect of the anterior ethmoid complex. And I'll show you what I mean in the lab. What makes the frontal challenging? We're working in very narrow confines. We're using an angled approach. There's often limited exposure. You've got to use angled instruments. There are people who use 30 degree, 45 degree. I tend, we all have different ways of doing things and there's 100 ways of skinning a cat and not everybody does it one way. And I think the most important thing is that you do it the way you're most comfortable. I do my entire dissection with a zero degree scope except the frontal where I use a 70. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm using straight instrumentation for my um, sphenoethmoidectomy and I'm using 70 degree instrumentation for my frontal. And I think it matches up my vision really, really nicely. I think there's risk of causing harm in the frontal. And if my resident is not going to do a complete frontal sinus dissection, he's not going to do anything in the frontal sinus. So my, my, my view is that you either do it properly or you don't touch the frontal. I've seen so much pathology, iatrogenic pathology in the frontal sinus. So in the same way as we spoke about that horizontal box for the sphenoethmoid cavity, we've got a vertical box for the frontal. We've got the middle turbinate medially, we've got the orbital wall laterally, we've got the skull base and the posterior table projecting forwards, and we've got the nasal beak in front. And those are our limits of our dissection. Those are the limits of our dissection. And everything else is going to go out of the way. So we know we've got the bullet ethmoidalis, you've got the unsinner process, you've got the middle turbinate, 
we can follow it up. This is the area here that we want to come to because this is the area of the frontal sinus drainage. That's our limits of our frontal recess dissection. What complicates it is the cells that are in the way. We've got multiple pneumatization. We've got an agonase cell here. We've got a cell pneumatized above that, a, a, a front type 1 frontal cell. We've got a suprabullar cell, suprethmoidal e cell, air cell. There's our frontal drainage pathway. There's a multitude of different cells. I don't care what you call them. I don't care about the nomenclature. The important thing is that they're in the way of our, uh, of our box. And we want to remove them all until we've got the limits of our dissection. So the agonase cell is that nasal mound medially that you can see just above the middle turbinate when you look in. And that's the key to your frontal sinus. Coon cells are just air cells above the agonasia. There's a type 1, which is just a single cell not going up into the frontal. A type 2, where there's multiple cells, none going up into the frontal. A type 3, which is a large cell which extends up into the fr frontal. And a type 4, which is an isolated cell, or it's a cell that goes up more than 50% to the height of the frontal, depending on whose classification you use. And in fact, all of this is actually irrelevant because the whole thing has recently been reclassified completely. So it's really, there's no point in placing much importance on it other than assessing your sagittal CT scan so that you know how many cells you've got to remove in order to get where you want to go. So what are our limits of our frontal sinusotomy? Okay, this is on the left side. We've got the nasofrontal beak. We've got the ethmoid roof and the posterior table of the skull base. Laterally, I mean medially, we've got the, the orbital floor and the, orbital, the laminar preparation and the orbital roof. And medially, we've got the middle turbinate and the intersinus septum. And we want to be able to view the frontal recess with one view of an endoscope. Much like the otologists tell you with the, with the, the uh, canal plasties, you want to see the entire tympanic annulus with one view of the microscope. So you just got to think, well, what's getting in the way? You remove everything that's getting in the way, and you end up with your frontal recess. It's like Michelangelo, when he did the Statue of David, he had in his mind the Statue of David. He didn't think about what he was taking away. He just took everything else away until he was left with his final statue. So it's easy to think of, because if you think, what are the anterior structures that encroach? We've got frontal cells. Call them what you want. Just know how many there are and how high they go, because you need to know your instrumentation. We've got the agonase cell, which is really the key to the frontal sinus, and we'll show that in the lab. We've got a part of the superior uncinate. That's it. We've got, that's all we've got over here. Agonase cell, frontal cells, and superior part of the uncinate process. Everything here you can take until you get to your nasofrontal beak. Completely safe dissection. The surgical uncinate, much has been said about the surgical uncinate. Does it have a lateral attachment? Does it have a medial attachment? Where does it attach to? All BS, because the reality is it's very, very variable. And in fact, lateral drainage is probably of very minimal clinical significance anyway. The most important thing is the medial drainage, and you need to find that pathway. You're always going to find it. Posterior structures, there's two really important cells, the supraorbital ethmoid air cell and a suprabullar cell. The bullar ethmoidalis is lower down, and the bullar ethmoidalis is really your friend because it typically will guide you into the frontal sinus and it protects the anterior ethmoid artery. Here's a good diagram, a CT scan of uh, supraorbital ethmoid air cells. You can see on the coronal pneumatization over the orbit, but most important on the axial, again, like I showed you that a uh, horizontal bar in the sphenoid telling you that there's an anode. You've got a horizontal bar in the frontal recess on your axial scan. That's a supraorbital ethmoid air cell. And the importance of it is that it, it pneumatizes from backwards forwards, and so your frontal drainage pathway is anterior to it. So you need to be aware of that. The other thing is the suprabullar cell. If you've got there's your bullar ethmoid data set. There's a big agonase. There's your bullar ethmoid data set attaching to the skull base. Your anterior ethmoid is going to be about there. And you can get variable pneumatization. It can pneumatize up the skull base. And as it pneumatizes up the skull base, so it can narrow that frontal drainage pathway and lead to problems. And you just need to be aware of it because you want to remove the whole cell and using through-cutting frontal instrumentation. The lateral structures, the lateral structures, basically are some of those frontal cells, the agonase, which we're going to define early on, and the lateral part of the uncinate. And the medial structures are really just an intersinoseptal cell, 
and the medial inserting unsinner process. Very, very simple, easy to determine on your preoperative CT scan. So once you've identified those important structures and you've got your drainage pathway, then you just remove all those structures out the way and you're going to end up with a nice frontal recess. So if you combine your vertical and your horizontal boxes, you end up with a complete sinonasal cavity. And the slide tells me time's up, which is really, really good because that's my last slide, which says that we must simplify the anatomical boundaries of the frontal recess into a box-like fashion. And I want you to just think of the final cavity that you want to achieve and everything else goes. The only thing I ever really worry about is the anterior ethmoid artery, whether it's decent or not. Because otherwise, if I've got my landmarks, everything else between my landmarks is going. Not a problem at all. Thank you very much.